Good morning. It is Wednesday, December 16th. Just like to say uh, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. This will be the last Facebook Live for 2020. And given the fact that it's it's been a very interesting year, uh, we have made it from the COVID issue uh, up to the vaccine. And so now uh, during that time, we've talked about a myriad of topics. Uh, we've looked at a bunch of different perspectives and we look to gather that information, uh, seek uh, people who are shareholders and have the same uh, interests that we do. Uh, we know a lot of people have protested, a lot of people have spoken out. We decided to collaborate. And with the background of having uh, decades of knowledge in the Texas legislative system and arena, we've come together as law enforcement agencies and the African-American lawyers section of the State Bar of Texas. Uh, Kevin Lawrence from TMPA, um, Clay Taylor from the DPSOA, uh, Doug Griffin from the Houston Police Officer Association, uh, former st staffer and, and longstanding friend, chair of our section, council member, and now uh, president executive director uh, in the Capitol, working with the uh, Legislative Black Caucus, uh, Rudy Mater, and also our legislative chair, uh, Nikki Green. Uh, we've put together a variety of weekly uh, opportunities to discuss uh, a bunch of hot topics that we believed as a collaborative group will move our society and our communities forward. So we are not clashing and we're not having anarchists come and riot and disrupt positive human interaction and looking for ways for solutions. And that's what we have committed to do each and every Wednesday morning. So with that, Kevin, I uh, would like to turn it over to you. Certainly have appreciated our longstanding 20 plus year uh, relationship, the opportunity to work with you as a committee director and general counsel of the Senate Committee on Criminal Justice and also be a part of TMPA and representing your members as one of the attorneys that they could seek uh, for any assistance. And so uh, those longstanding relationships have come to be invaluable in this 2020 and interesting year. Thank you, Steve. I, I thought today we might talk about a topic that has been uh, you know, kind of in, in, in public uh, eye for the last you know, here recently. And, and as we go into the legislative session, we know it's going to be part of the proposals that are being made with regard to uh, law enforcement, criminal justice reform, et cetera. And that is the uh, uh, duty to intervene, whether or not law enforcement officers have a duty to intervene if and when another officer is using what would be considered to be excessive or unnecessary force, making an unlawful arrest, et cetera. And it's a, it is, it's another one of those issues uh, like most of them in this business, that's just not as clear cut as people might might imagine. If if they're if you don't have a background in criminal justice, it's hard to understand some of the the dynamics that come into play here. And I think one of the best examples I can give is let's and I'm going to do this very briefly. Talk about the Fourth Amendment. It's you know the, the Fourth Amendment prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures. Now which means police officers should not make unreasonable searches and seizures. And if they do, any evidence that they collect should be suppressed. It should not be allowed in a courtroom. But officers have to make a decision about whether or not that search is reasonable or that seizure is reasonable in that moment. You know, if you've got time, you can go get a warrant and then you don't have to worry about it. Then the judge decides the reasonableness. It's the question of whether or not there is an exception to the warrant requirement that exists in that moment. And very often that is because of exigency. It's because there is an emergency circumstance. So the officer has to make that judgment in the moment, just like whether or not to use force, whether or not to use deadly force has to be made in a split second. But then the examination of whether or not 
the search was reasonable, whether or not the seizure was reasonable, whether or not the use of force was in fact justified, may go on for months and sometimes even years. And as it works its way through the system, look at all the case law that's out there. Look at, look at how many cases go up, a defense attorney files a motion to suppress based upon Fourth Amendment. The court looks at it and the court says, we agree with you, that was an unreasonable search. And, it's, it's, and then the state appeals that, and then it goes up to an appellate court, and then it goes up to another appellate court, and then it winds up in the U.S. Supreme Court. And by the time it's all said and done, four years later, the U.S. Supreme Court makes a decision on a five to four vote or a six to three vote that either was or was not a reasonable search, a reasonable seizure, a necessary use of force. How is an officer supposed to make that decision in a split second when all these lawyers and judges can't figure it out over a period of years? And that's the, that's the difficulty we're going to face as we move into the legislative session and we try to change the standard about use of force and expect officers to intervene when another officer is using force. In, in that moment, are we really going to criminalize an officer's failure to come to the same decision that the courts will come to years from now? Did you guys have the opportunity to see the attorney general opinion that was issued on that question that was submitted? Yes, we have. Okay. Yeah, he pretty he, much talked he, about he, that as well. He basically said he thinks it's there, but since there's no case law on point, he can't say definitively <laughs> whether or not it's there. <laughs> it was a circle statement, right? No, yeah, I just thought yeah. that was interesting. And, and we believe it's there. We believe there's a duty to intervene and, and, and we could show you case after case after case where officers have been disciplined for failure to intervene, uh, for failure to act, because we believe there's a there, there's an, a, an overwhelming, an, an over uh, sight, you know, in, in the statute that says officers are expected to enforce the law, to protect citizens, protect the rights of our citizens. And that those standards carry over. Having it as an administrative matter, having it at where officers get disciplined over it is one thing. Telling officers we're going to put them in jail over it or, or we're going to take away their um, uh, qualified immunities over it and subject them and their families to financial ruin because they made a mistake is another matter. We think that's bad public policy. So Kevin, let me play devil's advocate, if you don't mind, Stephen, I'm sorry. Um, okay. With respect to that, how do you provide the balance, though? Because it is in, included in some administrative policies, right? The duty to intervene. That was a part of the eight can't wait um, initiative that people were sending out. And so you have different law enforcement agencies that are applying it inconsistently. So if they're applying it inconsistently and some do it, some have it in their administrative uh, manuals, like you said, you believe that it should be done. But there are a lot of agencies that don't have the duty to intervene policy in their administrative um, in their administrative rules. And there's not really a consequence if you don't intervene or there's not really a standard that says if you don't intervene, you're gonna be punished in this way or in that way. And so it almost is like it's there, but there's not really any teeth to it. So how do you balance that? I, actually, we believe there is teeth to it. We believe that you know there there is recourse available. Officers, like I said, are getting disciplined for it on a regular basis, and the officer and their department can, in fact, be sued civilly if it is a you know an obvious case where there should have been intervention and there was not. There's still the ability to sue. The qualified immunity isn't an absolute immunity like it is for prosecutors, but <laughs> I'll get back to that later. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's, it's a qualified immunity. It's a reasonableness standard yet again, which is where we believe the bar should be. It should be based upon the reasonableness of the actions of that officer in that moment, given the facts and circumstances known to the officer in that moment. So getting away from the reasonableness standard to something, you know, it, it's very easy to sit, you know, in, in a, a committee hearing and say, you know, an officer should absolutely never, ever, ever use a hatchet on somebody in the course and scope of their duties. But you know what? I could probably cite you a couple of cases where it actually became necessary. <laughs> that would be well, that's, well, the word exception is 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 just for that. My my question would be like we have in in the legal arena, is there a model um is there a model uh, rule for a duty to intervene kind of that 
that those national organizations that or the fraternal order of police or something, is there is there somewhere where you can take that reasonable standard and say, here's what we see as probably a, a, a group across, you know, sizes of agencies, location in the country that we think here's here's a model standard for duty to intervene. Is there anything like that that at least you can use as as that? And, and Stephen, if you don't mind, if you don't mm -hmm. mind um, I, I, I want to ask him one quick follow up before we get to duty intervene on that because something Nikki brought up to you regarding um, and Kevin just touched on regarding qualified immunity and the reasonableness standard. Isn't it the issue that essentially, though, be, the actual application of qualified immunity uh, or the, the reasonable standard, not qualified immunity, gets to a point because of qualified immunity that it has to be almost an exact match from a fact, fact standpoint to be able to go ahead and put an officer on notice regarding issues or concerns? Where consequently, more often than not, you know, kind of like in our legal cases, we have things that are analogous to certain situations that we have to, but we usually more often than not, there's definitely different different fact scenarios that go with that. Because you're absolutely right. If you're asking someone split second, hey, listen, this is what I'm gonna do, boom, 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 in the story, okay, I, I completely understand it. That that makes sense. And there should be exceptions from working from there as well. But I also don't think it should be all the way to a, you know, I'm, I would say the analogy of gross negligence standard regarding that. There has to be some subset just because by nature of the job and the ability to enforce things. And that's the hard part, right? Because an officer has a unique ability, you know, because there's unique powers and broad discretion, which we would like, but at the same time, how do you wrap it up down to make sure that that's actually used in the right fashion? And that's probably where, you know, and that's the hard thing about, you know, qualified immunity is a, a, um, a it, it, it's not a specific denoted in um, history guidance, but it's just kind of like a, a legal conjecture thing that has been created. And that's where it's kind of evolved to. Well, I, I, I do believe that qualified immunity is based upon a reasonable standard. And, and basically, and you guys are the lawyers, I'm not, but basically what it says is, unless we have given officers, you know, some sort of reasonable guidance about what, what the, the law is, we should be holding them personally liable for behavior that we have not let them know is not what we want them to do, especially if it is exactly what they've been trained and taught to do. So yeah. I don't think I don't think the qualified immunity is the issue is the, is the correct recourse here or not changing the qualified immunity It's like Steve says, it's let's make sure we're giving these officers that proper guidance that we are in fact creating those standards uh, across a, a broader uh, cross section. You know, we've got representatives here from the police officers union, Doug Griffith, by the way, Steve, I'm going to correct you on that. And again, congratulations, Doug, the new, he's newly sworn in as the president of HPOU. Oh, okay. Congratulations, yeah. Doug. <laughs> thank you. All thank right. You. We've got right. Clay Taylor, retired lieutenant with DPS, you know, the, the current executive director of DPS OA. They both spent their careers working for agencies that have those policies, that have that kind of stuff in place. Okay. Stuff that probably could be used as models. But you're right, there's other departments, you know, 2,700 law enforcement agencies across the state of Texas. There's a whole lot of agencies that don't have those policies. So a push toward a, a set of standards. And, and by the way, Steve, you also asked the question, are there standards out there? Not only are there departments that have the policies in place like DPS in Houston, but there's also uh, standards that have been, you know, uh, best practices that have been developed by different entities. Now, we can debate how good some of them are versus how bad some of them are, but the Texas Police Chiefs Association has a set of standards they've recommended. Texas Association of Sheriffs has some. Um, uh, there's the International Association of Chiefs for, Chief for Police. There's a couple of different accreditation um, entities out there like Kalia that have created boilerplate best practices. Uh, some agencies have adopted them, some have not. But let, me stop, let me stop you right there, Kevin, because that's you bring up a good point. You just named, I think, four or five different ones. And I'm thinking to myself, well, shouldn't there be in, in you want flexibility depending on the department, depending on what they're doing? I completely understand that. But shouldn't there be some sort of ubiquitous one whereby, okay, listen, this is the standard, and and you can deviate based on resources made available, probable scenario, all these other things with it as well. Because it's something we've talked about over and over again is that training, 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 and, and trying to actually get these best, best practices or 
I always say better practices because I don't know if necessarily best practices are always applicable to every department, but better practices than what they have with that. You know, well, and, and Kevin, and Kevin, you said training, but recall, we say sometimes that's the first thing to go. If in fact you have your electeds talking about, you know, we're not making this or meeting that, and you're dealing with that shortfall in an agency. So Rudy, you kind of almost put yourself in a bad situation, but nonetheless, I think what we're talking about is, do you have some place that you can go to and say, duty to intervene should look like this? I'd rather you or, or, or you, the second person plural you, choose something and say, we're using these guys or we're using these guys. You know, uh, the examples come to where, you know, <coughs> Texas is the only state that uses the NCAA football rules. All the other states use the federation rules, but they've chosen some, you know, standards to use for their high school football. Choose something. So it, it, what, what you have and you choose nothing is a third grade basketball team with a coach that doesn't know how to run the offense. Is it high, low? Is it pick and roll? You just see five kids running around and it's chaos. Well, it, it happens the same thing in the adult world, but we don't want that in law enforcement. Well, Stephen, I, that, was a, that was a highly specific example. I'm thinking, did you coach third graders and you're still bitter about what happened? With <laughs> no, we used to beat third grade teams that had no offense and we would shut them down. Oh, they no, were they were highly they were skilled and very well case. coached. <laughs> uh, by the way, we were talking earlier. Uh, we, we do have a, a uh, greeting from State Representative Tony Tenderholt, who's tuned in again today. So thank you, sir, for joining us. We appreciate it and we appreciate the kind words. Uh, it's a very good point, but we, we've talked about this before. As you say, it's not all, it, it's not sometimes the first thing to go, Steve. It's almost always the first thing to go when you start cutting budget is training starts getting cut out and then personnel starts getting cut. And that's not the correct solution. The correct solution is to increase those standards and increase the, uh, the training budgets, uh, even increase the staffing levels. So does, can... does Representative Tinderholt know that there hasn't been an increase in officers Doug, since 98? Yeah, we actually lost 200 since 98. Oh, so wow. we're down. Oh, even, yeah. even better. See, even better. Since 1998, we've lost 200. And the population hasn't grown in Texas at all. So don't worry about that. Yeah, we're, we're over 500,000 extra people with 200 less officers. So, yeah, it's, uh, I had an email the other day from another state representative uh, where we were having this conversation. And I, I will tell you, I think what's going to happen, and, and this is, I'm putting on my prognosticator hat. I think what you're going to see is there, there's going to be a, a, a blue ribbon panel put together as was recommended by the Sunset Commission to examine this over the next two years and to come up with some recommendations. And I think those recommendations are going to have to include expanding T. Cole's authority, expanding T. Cole's resources, uh, and then having them create a set of best practices, uh, which would include a list of several, I don't know, three, four, half a dozen, maybe different accreditation programs that are out there and then requiring every law enforcement agency in the state of Texas to adopt one of them. Now, whether or not there's going to be an exception for departments with fewer than X number of officers, We'll have to wait and see how the, you know, it's all, the devil's always in the details. Uh, but I do believe that's the, that's the direction we are going from the conversations we're having with different members of the legislature. Uh, I think that's the direction we're headed in. And, and in all honesty, and as I told the state rep, I was communicating with the other day, TMPA has been pushing for this since 1950. You know, mm -hmm. TMPA was the entity that first recommended that Texas have a state commission on law enforcement. We met, we first made that proposal in 1960 and it didn't happen until 1970. We were the ones that introduced what, what was called at the time, the gypsy cop bill back in 2003. TMPA has always pushed for higher standards, you know, more professionalism in law enforcement in Texas. The, what has always stopped us has been local politics and money. So that's, that's a good yeah. question. That's a good point, Kevin, because to me, it, it's so bewildering because if you've been asking for these things, 
and you're cognizant of these things and you think they're better and you know and more important and vital practices for something you know for law enforcement does how do we overcome the issues from um, local governments issues and concerns about it because they're they're unique you I mean just like you said you have 2700 2700 um, law enforcement units across the state is it that we just make sure that they have the applicable um, money to make sure they're able to enforce and enforce and actually have the applicable training necessary training that you guys set as a standard with it or is it just an education saying hey listen we're not trying to tell you guys what to do but we also know that we, we have an important job in our relationship with with the public and we feel like that if we have these standards if we have this ability to go ahead and do this then we'll be able to work better in unison regarding the issues and concerns that better met not just law enforcement but the entire community at all no i don't i don't think either one of those gets you there um, and by the way, I realize I am hogging this conversation. So Doug and, and Clay, you guys jump in here anytime you please. Uh, but I don't think that gets you there. Right? Fine job. I think it, <laughs> it has to include more than that. It has to include mandates that unless you are willing to, unless you are able to come up to these standards, you shouldn't have a law enforcement agency at all. You should, you should consolidate services or so on and so forth. But it also has to include some meaningful due process for all these officers like they have in Houston, right. like they have with DPS. There, there, are, there are some means of due process because you have to take the local politics and the cronyism out. You know? And when I, when I talk about due process, a lot of people think, well, he's a union guy. He's just trying to protect his members. And that's not the case at all. But due process means a fair shake. It means that you've got fair treatment one way or the other. You know, sometimes fair is you got fired and you, you should stay fired if that was fair. Sometimes fair means you go to jail if that's, what, if that's where the facts take us, okay? A fair shake is not getting fired because you wrote the city manager's ticket, brother a ticket for something. It's just, you know, and if you look around the state and I, you know, I can mention a couple of local law enforcement agencies where we've seen some examples of this recently, but look at the number of chiefs, sheriffs, city managers, council members, even prosecutors, even judges that get prosecuted, that get charged and, and arrested for different crimes all the time. That if you, if you don't have some sort of, of, of review above the city manager level, above the sheriff level, then you're, you're, you're exposing yourself to the potentials for corruption. That's and Kevin, the, uh, what about the, having the, Doug's or, 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 or DPS, they're already created. No need to reinvent the wheel. So can we give these standards, give these processes that have been highly effective and, and again, and, and roll them out? Well, there, there's no sense of recreating things that we know work. I think that the whole difficulty, which we have somewhat overcome this whole year, is the collaboration and communication and the sharing of information. A lot, you know, some of us may not have known. Nonetheless, getting it to each other makes it a very different place to operate and to commiserate. And, and if Doug and, and Clay already have these on the books, can't we just share them? Sure. That, they're available right now. They're not being adopted for a number of weeks because they're not mandated. They're not right. Required. Right. And, and, and again, but the mandate look at, where you're going to run against the resistance. The resistance is going to be it's an unfunded liability and you're interfering with local control. And those two things have to be overcome. <laughs> Well, but there's things that have been implemented on the state level. <laughs> yeah, but the, but the governmental interest that the state level would use for that uniformity, I think, again, not to get into constitutional law and all that good stuff, but, but there are balancing tests that you do or are allowed to implement things for the betterment of the whole. And, and, and it doesn't, uh, you know, it's content neutral. So it's, it's everybody. That's like saying... Oh, well, the state can't mandate you or the feds can't mandate you to wear a seatbelt. But, you know, here's the deal. And maybe you what you do is you say, OK, if you don't adopt this, then you don't get the funding 
that comes with it. That's right. How, how we got, you know, that's how we got rid of open container law. That was, that was a sad day, <laughs> especially for the passenger. The driver, I get, but Wait, you know, Nikki, what I'm Nikki was talking about that earlier. I did. He was talking. We were talking about uh, statistics for um, alcohol and drug abuse between law enforcement. And I told him that I think that the attorney profession has them beat on alcohol. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> we'll <take that> one. <laughs> Not me per se. I'll me just neither. But we'll take what that I've one. seen, I've heard. <laughs> well, for for this discussion, you've got you're kind of running into two different topics here because you're talking about one this this uh, duty to respond and making it a law. If we have the processes in place to get that taken care of on a local level, that's my concern about stretching this into a law. If you try to put in a bill or something like that, where you're adding a criminal penalty to it, that's where I see that we're gonna have a problem. And I'll tell you why. One, when you're on a scene, you're not, you may not be paying attention to everything going on on that scene. You may be dealing with one guy and something else is going on over here. And then they're going to want to say, hey, why didn't you notice what was going on? You can't. It's so subjective at that point that we have to be used caution in what we decide to make a criminal act versus something that should be handled with a termination, a training, some kind of issue like that. But Doug, if we're adding, if you balance that though with the due process for, uh, that Kevin is talking about, why wouldn't that work? That's, that's what I'm saying. If we didn't, it, we, if we don't force it into a, a law with a criminal penalty, but we spread this across the state and even level for everybody through T Cole, then you're going to have a win win for everybody. And I'll tell you why because you force these people to train, you force every department, every AC to train the same. And you know, when you get on a scene, what's expected of you. These smaller departments, they do not train properly. I'm, I don't care what anybody says. They don't because it's they're only mandated for 20 hours a year. That's just, that's the way it is. And that's all their budget requires. So if you make a best practices through t -Cole, you have to have these standards. You have to have these type of policies in place. If you do not, you don't get the funding through the state. I think that'll be a faster way to deal with this. And you're putting it on where the issue should be. Again, as we said, the difference between best, you know, bad policemen and bad policing. Bad policing comes a lot of times from policies and procedures that are either ineffective, not there, or just completely written wrong. So you get everybody on the same page with those types of, of issues, you're going to have a much better, a much better trained department. You're going to have a, a better system by which to control all these officers that are out there on the streets. Because right now, in 80% of departments around the state, the supervisor can walk in and fire somebody for no reason other than, I don't like the way they look, I don't like the way they act, I don't like the way they wrote my cousin a ticket, whatever. We have to get some kind of standards across the board for every officer in the state. And everybody talks about the 143 protections. That only protects about 15 to 20% of the law enforcement community in the state of Texas. And then it's not an absolute protection. It just gives them the right to appeal to a higher authority. That's it. There's, I don't see anything wrong with that. It'd be just like you having your day in court. Everybody has that and should have that. Would, would people be amenable is, to that? Isn't, uh, isn't Sunset, isn't T. Cole up for Sunset this year as well? Yeah. yeah, this is that's what I was referring to is the Sunset Commission has actually recommended extending TCOL yeah. for two more years, but in the in, in that two years that the, that this blue ribbon panel be put together. And by the way, I'm I'm making no secret of the fact that I am gonna beg and plead and scream and holler and you know waddle, whatever I have to, to be do. a part of it. I want to be on that commission. Yeah. Uh but have that commission get together and actually examine uh, what the state of Texas needs to do uh, in order to make, and, and, and let me say this, T. Cole under Kim Vickers and, and me and me and Chief Vickers have had our share of disagreements about all, any number of subjects. Uh, but I do believe he has done a better job than any of his predecessors of trying to turn T. Cole into the regulatory agency that it needs to be, but they right. have never been given the resources or the authority that are necessary to get that job accomplished. Uh, 
And in all honesty, I think most people are surprised like I was to find that, that we're not further behind. Uh, there are other states that are even further behind than Texas is. I was, I was amazed that Massachusetts doesn't currently have a regulatory agency for their law enforcement officers. That just, that, that baffles me that, that that is the case. So I, I think I think Chief Vickers and his staff have done a uh, you know, commendable job with the resources and the authorities that they have, but it, we, we need to rethink that. It, 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 we need to expand that level of control, that level of authority and their resources, but at the same time, we cannot throw the individual officers to the wolves for the failure of our system. Right. We have to make sure that we, we are focusing on keeping good cops in the business as much as we are trying to get the bad cops out of the business. And I absolutely agree with that. And, and it, what was interesting about that report is that I, I think the lay person, again, the lay, you know, the General Joe is not an officer, not in law enforcement, would just assume that TCO would have the same powers that you know the the nursing board or the you know the medical board has with doctors, et cetera. You just you have this impression because it's like, hey, wait a minute, that's just you're there. That's your job. You're able to enforce it. You're able to investigate and work claims with that. And is it is it? And you mean Kevin and Kevin Doug? You know, this is where you guys can help us with that as well. Why hasn't that evolved through the years? Is it just been because of the financial aspect, just what we're saying, having a local control aspect with that? Or is it just, I mean, what's the hesitant that's been with that? Yeah, Doug, I'd love to know. And, and, and Kevin may disagree with me on this, um, but I'm a firm believer that one, T coal should be made up of active and or retired, fully vested police officers. You can't be appointing people that are some reserve deputy from some no-name county that's never done a police work, never done real police work in his career. That's a problem. And we know, I, I'm sure Kevin knows people that have been on that commission before that sit in that kind of role. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sorry, you, that's not the appropriate person that needs to be in there actually putting the work in to make sure that we have the most professional agency in the state. It's just not. I, I, well, I think law enforcement should not be politicized. And I think when you're doing that type of disservice, you feel it downstream more. It's not going to yep. be at the com at the commission level. It's going to be at the citizen level. Because nobody pushed for standards. Nobody pushed for the training aspect. Because like you said, Doug, if you don't recognize the importance of it because you've really not got your feet wet and, and, and submerged yourself into law enforcement, you might not have the same perspective. You don't, you just can't. Yeah. And I, and, and Rudy, back to your question, I, you know, there's a whole bunch of different dynamics that play into this. It's not just one factor that has caused it. Lack of funding, lack of resources has resulted from opposition from any number of different quarters for any number of different reasons. Um, but very often, like I say, it comes, it comes down to uh, a question of control and a question of funding. Uh, you know, giving T. Cole the authority to overrule a constitutionally elected sheriff, the sheriffs are going to have a problem with that. Yeah. But, you know, if, if there's not somebody between that constitutionally elected sheriff and God Almighty, then, you know, there's an old saying that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. If, if anybody's got absolute power, there's always that potential that that power is going to get abused. And that's when the citizens start losing out. Uh, and I think we've seen a really good example of that right here close to home over the last year and a half uh, that, that we should wake up. We should pay attention to that. I mean, just take a look. We, we're going to have a brand new sheriff in Fort Bend County, somebody who I respect and, and just love to death. But when he goes in there, there's going to be some house cleaning. There's going to be people removed from their positions and new people are going to be instilled, uh, installed in those positions that may or may not know the dynamics of that community. So it makes it very difficult uh, for anybody that's removed from their position there, but he can do that at a whim. So that, that gives him power to go in and make any kind of sweeping changes he wants to make with zero accountability. I and know that, him well, 
But they have civil service. They have civil service and he still has that kind of sweeping authority. Yep. It's a really good point. I've heard anybody say that before, Doug. That's a, that's a good point. Um, you know, and, and again, this is why these conversations have been so fruitful in a lot of ways, because in all of certain, I mean, again, lay people, who gets to have these conversations? Who gets to hear these viewpoints? Who gets to hear these ideas? We, we have concepts, conjecture, and um, things that we think are that, but you guys are telling us reality with that stuff, and it's, it's, it's illuminating to say the least right there as well. And, um, and, 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 you know, and I also think at the same time, it also lets people know, hey, listen, again, People, the, particularly the media, I think they try to put us all on different sides regarding these things where we're all, no, 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 we're all, we're all in the same side. There are things that we're going to disagree on, absolutely, but, mm -hmm. but we all agree that we want the best protections for our citizens and for this state and this country and working from there as well and work toward that. And um, some people don't like to see that happen. I, I personally, <laughs> yeah, that's my personal opinion, but um, conversations like this, this is where it helps have these things. Well, I think a lot of times where citizens lose out is if you don't know, and there's truth to knowledge is power, and there can be uh, some uncomfortability or unfamiliarity because there are different segments of the population. And when you interact, and as you say, Doug, you're interacting not um, necessarily at the, the blue Santa toy drive, you're, you're operating in a scenario that could be, you know, contentious. The lack of knowledge, uh, the lack of familiarity amongst uh, community citizens puts us in a situation, again, I think we've identified that things roll downhill, that the shortcomings at the top seem to adversely affect the most at the bottom or when law enforcement interacts at those times. So uh, we've done our level best to get information gathered. And I think at some point I'd like to figure out how we kind of codify a lot of the things that we've talked about, because I think if the citizenry knew a lot of these things, I think they could have a different approach with law enforcement and law enforcement would recognize that they're now dealing with a much more educated community. And I think that would help even if there is a lack of leadership at the top, at least people down uh, closer where the rubber meets the road have a better understanding about what's going on uh, with this functionality. And, and, you know, I wish Fred was here because I, I still have an appreciation for him kind of going, you know, uh, bare bones about what what should be done and i think there's some merit to that um but even with that uh until we really sat down with these discussions a lot of these things and even us as professionals um in our own rights hadn't really put a lot of these pieces together let me let me give you just a quick example of how sometimes we overthink some of these things the after the Ferguson uh, Michael Brown uh, episode, the uh, police, what is, what is it called? Police Executive Research Forum, PERF. They spent two years studying police use of force and policies and everything. And they finally came up with a very lengthy report in which they made a number of recommendations. But one of them, was that they recommended that agencies adopt what, what came to be known as the lawful but awful standard. Now, what that said was they recommended that departments adopt policies that said officers should be fired if they engage in conduct that even though it was perfectly lawful and justified legally, it just looked so bad that it brought the department into, into disrepute. And therefore, it was it was justified termination. Now, fortunately, almost nobody adopted that standard. But this two years worth of research came up with that recommendation. Think about trying to apply that. If you're in a job where there's absolutely no way of doing the job you've been assigned to do where it looks good all the time, 
but you know you're going to get fired if you do something that just looks bad, how much effort are you going to put into that job? Because that's what you've talked about. If, 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 if I assign a, a female officer, and I don't mean to pick on women, and Nikki, I apologize for this analogy, but I assign a female officer as a school resource officer at Wiley High School. And she weighs 130 pounds. She's five foot four, but she's a great cop. You know, she handles herself great. She gets called to a disturbance in the cafeteria one day. And there is a uh, offensive lineman from the football team who weighs about 290. He just got kicked off the team for using steroids and his girlfriend broke up. And he's just gone off the oh, rail. <laughs> Tell me how she's supposed to subdue him without it looking bad. at some, If it's one-on-one, -on -one, her and him, how is she supposed to handle that situation without it somehow looking bad at some point? And the answer is, she may have to use a taser. She may have to use a baton. She may have to use a gun. But at some point, it's going to look bad. But she's still got a job to do. So if she's subject to that standard, you're not allowed to do anything that might look bad. We got a, we got a problem. And, but I, and I, would, I would think that in that situation, the look bad is the context that I would look at it, right? If she's looking at her size and what she's able to do in his size, if that is the reasonable way that she would have to, you know, if saying them, would it technically look bad or would that be reasonable? But in order to do that, you got to sit back and look at it and examine it and look at all the evidence and all the facts and all the witnesses and also you can't make that decision within, you know, I don't know, five or six hours when the chief goes ahead and fires that person like the chief in Arlington did a few years ago on the case. It's, and like happens every day, but I, I mentioned that one only because it was very high profile. It you yes you have there has to be a reasonableness standard in all of this you have to look at it from the totality of the yeah, and that's the point we've been making all along the fact that it looks bad is not is not really the issue here was it a bad decision was it inappropriate given the circumstances and that's the standard we have to use police work within its nature is ugly and we have to face that. People have to understand that. We're not dealing with the best in people. 90% of the time, we're dealing with the worst in people. And we have to understand. Everybody needs to understand. We are in these positions because we get called there. We don't go volunteer and go, hey, you know what? I think I'm just going to drive around found the biggest guy I can and let him just kick my butt today. It don't work like that. We, we go out there. We get calls. We go and handle those calls the best of our ability. Sometimes it's just ugly. And we don't want to be that way, but the suspect can dictate at the end of the day what happens on that scene most of the time. So the long and the short of that is what we're looking for is we're looking for good public policy. We're looking for giving our officers better training, better direction, uh, you know, better resources to get out there and do their jobs. But we also have to make sure that when something does happen, we don't rush to judgment. We don't, we don't automatically, you know, uh, the Ferguson effect is very real. You know, we had looting and riots and, and all kinds of stuff going on because of what turned out to be a lie. Uh, because a lot of people were just willing to believe the lie and not wait for the facts to come in, not wait for the, fu the full investigation to be completed. That is not a defense of any officer in any given circumstance. It is simply saying, wait for the facts to come in, wait for the investigation to be completed. Then we take the appropriate remedial actions. Well, I'll say this, just, just so I'm on record and I'll, I'll speak for myself. There were some people that will be upset in the community. And we've said this as a group, as a whole, uh, there are some uh, people that wanted to take advantage of scenarios and anarchists apply and, 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 and insert themselves. That's not just black America rioting and looting because I said to people Correct. all the time, if that's the case, why don't we just riot and loot on Tuesday? I mean, because that's what we do. You know, if that's what if that's what we do, you know, we're gonna schedule one for next Thursday because you know that's what we do. That's not what Black America does. Black America feels frustration just like anybody else. Um and most of the time, again, just like most law enforcement is good, but they uh, have their becomes an insertion or part of that group that that takes it um offline or or is not uh what the social norms are 
but as a whole, um, and, and I'm not pointing to you, Kevin, in particular, but it seems to me that people look at me and go, well, we just love the fact that you get the opportunity to speak to people because other black Americans go out and riot and loot. And I said, wait a minute, <laughs> that's not the solution that people run to as the first order of business because something may not be um, copacetic in the community. That's not the case. In fact, it's like peace officers, law enforcement. Most law enforcement is good, <laughs> but you wanna focus on the percentage that goes off the reservation and you wanna say all cops are bad. All white cops wanna shoot minorities. That's a poor narrative that media puts out because that catches my attention. That shows, oh, see, I knew that. Or that matches the clip. And that's not necessarily true. So that's and I, just. And I, and I don't disagree with the word of that, Steve. As a matter of fact, my, my comments were more aimed at our media than they were at any given segment of our society, uh, especially those four CNN anchors <laughs> that uh, made a, a big stunt out of that. Uh, just, just like the folks that were protesting outside the Michigan Secretary of State's home don't represent white America. That, you know, that's, that's not what we should be doing in any circumstance. It, it is not the way to affect good public policy. What right. we should be doing, as Rudy said, is we should be coming together and having these conversations and talking about real issues and real solutions to those issues. And unfortunately, we live in a time when, I'm sorry, but as a nation, we don't wait for the facts to come out. We, you know, it's, it's, and I'm not talking about black America, brown America, yellow America, white America. I'm talking about America. We just don't wait for the facts to come out. Well, that's one it's thing that we have to do. In five minutes. You know, it's, yeah. <laughs> Well, that's one thing that we have to do. And, and again, I very much want to say, you know, for what we've done this year in a very interesting season in the world, uh, I believe we've been um, very consistent, transparent, and, and I commend the efforts of, of all to be willing to be transparent, frank, direct, and, and recognize, yeah, we have issues. No doubt. Nonetheless, if we don't address them, they are going to wind up being more of a problem than they are uh, getting us to a solution. And, and we, you have to go through those things to get to the solution you want. And we're going to have to talk in ways that are uncomfortable. And I appreciate as we've done that in 2020, that no one has made it personal and no one has said, well, because you bring these things up, you're bad, or because you bring these up, you're the good guy and everybody else is bad, so. And Stephen, I would also just like to throw in there before we conclude that we've found through these discussions that there's more middle ground than what we probably anticipated when we first started having these conversations. I look back to our first conversations we were talking about um, some of the- Yeah, Nikki wanted to fight y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm I mean, it's been very, um, it's these, these conversations have been educational, informative, and also, you know, I know that they will work towards us getting some change um, done in the next legislative session. So well, I have a hard stop at 11. And so I just want to say Merry Christmas before I drop off. Merry and Christmas. I appreciate you guys and you guys are safe and uh, take care. That was it. Merry Christmas, everybody. Certainly, we want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. We want to make sure everybody knows we're not going to be here the next two Wednesdays, I guess, uh, with the holidays coming along. So we, we will be back on, on January the 6th. I hope everybody will join us. And, and, and I think what we're talking about now is, since the, the legislature will be starting in the week following that, um, perhaps we can focus these conversations on the bills that have been filed uh, maybe bills that you know we, we know are going to be brought up and, and, and have hearings in committees and so on and so forth, and we can kick those back and forth. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, would, I would say that um, I'll be more direct than what Steve and Nikki were regarding this. The problems we're having in this country is because people aren't having these conversations. That's the issue. Amen. That, they have done, they're not having these conversations. They're not talking to each other about them because you don't get things done staying in your silos. And until we have people who are willing to go and cross across different viewpoints, ideas, concepts, and concerns, and talk and work with one another, 
as we've been taught and why this great land's been the way it has been and the way it has been and the way it's been moving forward with that, we will continue to have these issues. So use this as an example in this holiday season. Use an example for the peak regarding this is that, listen, communication isn't a bad thing. Talking about different viewpoints isn't a bad thing. It's the respect and the honor and reserve that you, when you're having these conversations that makes a difference in what you can do to actually be productive to make things happen. And that's what we're doing here. Well, Rudy, I hope you bring in Kevin, Doug, Clay. I know Kevin and, and Clay are a lot closer than Doug. Uh, however, uh, given the delegation of Houston and, and the important members there and, and the mayor being a, a former member of the legislature, I hope that you incorporate um, these uh, resources as people to what your mission is, uh, which is phenomenal. And the timing couldn't have been better for you. Yep, oh, absolutely. Actually, we have a meeting scheduled later on this week. <laughs> so there you go. Right. Rudy and I will be having a conversation. I believe it's Friday afternoon. We've got yeah. something set up, right? Yeah. All right, guys. I've also got a hard stop, so I got to get out of here. Thank you all. Merry Christmas. If I Merry don't. Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. Pray Thank for you. Holidays. Thank you, guys. Let's see what happens with the Aggies in two weeks. Merry Christmas, right. everybody. There you go. <laughs>